Hey everyone, just wanted to make a brief mention. This episode with the founder and an instructor at StatMed Learning is going to be a two-parter. Unfortunately, we had some difficulties getting audio from the guest side microphone, so his part will be cell phone quality. It may be best to listen to this when you can focus on the audio, or are otherwise less distracted. Other than that, it was a great interview packed with tons of information, stories, and real-world experiences. I hope you enjoy. Welcome to the Medical Menemist Podcast, your source for memory techniques and accelerated learning in higher education. Now, here's your host, Chase DeMarco. There are many study methods when discussing the boards and graduate level exams. Being efficient and understanding time management is one skill required for accelerated learning. Today, we have Ryan Orwig, creator of StatMed Learning, where he teaches med students and doctors better ways to study, maximize their time, create memory palaces, and take board-style tests. Ryan, so glad to have you on the show today. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. So what got you into, I guess, creating StatMed, creating this program directed for medical students and doctors and making their study time more efficient? Well, my background is a little uncommon, I think, in medical education. So my background is I'm not a doctor. I'm not someone with a medical background. My background comes from in the late 90s, I was an educator, I was a teacher, I was working with gifted kids with reading and learning and attention problems. That's where all the money was, so it's not you know, exorbitant amounts of money, but that's where the research was, that's where the programs were. My colleague David and I, we, we met in the late 90s teaching at a college prep high school in Baltimore for kids with reading and learning and attention problems. And we ran adventure camps for kids with reading and, and, and uh, attention problems. And so our background came from looking at the way these, these smart, motivated kids process information, either through the reading filter or just through the learning filter. And then after that, we're teaching for a while and teaching. I, I go and get my master's in the science of teaching, learning, and leadership from Oklahoma, in Oklahoma. And I was on a PhD, some sort of track there. We moved back to West Virginia in the early 2000s, and I ended up taking over this small program for med students. I was just going to do it, med students with learning and reading problems, attention problems. I was just going to do it for a few years and figure out what track I was going to go on, and then I, I, I never left that field. So since 2004, I've only worked with medical students and doctors who struggle in, you know, in, in coding, man, managing the volume, interpreting questions, and all that stuff. So as I started doing it, I started to see patterns. And as I saw patterns, I started to build solutions. I read the, re- the research, I read the literature. I didn't see anything that I liked that I felt like was actionable enough. I felt like a lot of the, sc- the skills and strategies for studying and test taking for doctors and med students were just upgraded from the MCAT or the SAT or even like these weird strategies we use with like fifth graders. And so I just threw all that out. And through pattern recognition, through seeing hundreds and hundreds of these med students and doctors coming my way, built strategies and methodologies to offset the issues and help them unlock their aptitudes. And that led to just that med learning. Okay. I love having learning specialists on and kind of getting their interpretation of how the current medical education system is set up. Because what you learn from your professors during med school is usually very different. They don't have any education in education, in learning, in the science. Yeah, exactly. So getting the different paradigms, the different points of view are very interesting to me. And for all of the audience, in full disclosure, I took StatMed probably a year and a half ago now, whenever it was, it's been a while, two years ago. And I was particularly interested in the approach you take for those with learning disabilities and the concepts of memory intensive board exam questions, sort of right. the, the working memory aspect of that. Could you explain to the audience a little bit more about that philosophy? Well, yeah. Well, like I said, we, a, a part of our, our, our initial cohort did have learning issues, but the overwhelming majority of our students don't have any kind of diagnosable learning issue. I just think that there are, it's crazy to think that all doctors and med students have the same flat level of high all the different subsets for cognitive constitution. So what we see, if someone is struggling, so we offer the SATMED 
class, which is all the study methodology that's for memory palaces are part of, and we, then we do offer the stat med boards workshop, which is what you did. That's for the, the self-identified bad test taker. So what we're interested in here is identify, you have to identify patterns. This is not for everybody, but it's for that med student or doctor who feels like they're making too many unforced errors. They're missing too many questions they should not miss, not based on what they should know, but actually based on what they do know. And so where is this coming from? What's the genesis of this? And this is where I think, what Chase, I think you're alluding to is, I think one of the issues with the way the USMLEs, the complexes, the uh, specialty boards have all evolved is this, this old idea that the higher the IQ, the higher the working memory. So I think in part, testing issues start with working memory. So if the way these questions have evolved, I think there's a blind, unspoken, unintentional expectation that everybody sitting at the table taking, doing questions has a robust working memory. Most people, obviously the majority of med students are gonna have high IQs, that's fine, it's true. But it doesn't necessarily mean that their working memories are robust. So working memory, I'm using that old models, you can hold on to seven plus or minus two items the last 30 seconds, give or take, it's where we solve problems. So to me, that's where you're, when you're reading questions, all that stuff is getting front loaded into that working memory. And if your working memory is not as robust as everyone else's, you're going to be more likely to lose pieces of information, to lose a clue, to lose a thought, to lose a conclusion, to lose sight of what the question is asking. Because your the way the working memory works is it's, you know, you fill up your, so say you have seven working memory slots and the person sitting, the majority of people sit next to you have 10, 11 working memory slots. If they can hold on to 10, 11 pieces of information, you can hold on to seven, the average. That puts you below average for these people. You're going to lose a clue. It's going to make the wrong answers appear to be right. So I think that, that this element of the way that people's brains are constructed is, 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 is at, at, at play. I mean, it's not going to affect the way the person practices medicine. It's not going to affect their ability to succeed in med school necessarily. I mean, if it is, then you just need compensatory mechanisms to offset it. So a big part of how we teach test taking, again, our test taking methodology is not for everybody. But at the heart of it, one of the keys has to be we, would, we need to limit the burden on that working memory. I think you probably saw that. Does that make sense, Chase, what I'm talking about? Am I, am I articulating that properly? Well, I have intimate knowledge with the program, so to me it makes sense. I think it does to the audience too, but to delve into that a little more, for example, you can have a board-style question that is a paragraph long with 12 potential answer choices and six pertinent negatives and four pertinent positives within it, which are important details to either rule in or rule out possible answers. And it's just a lot of information. And by the time you get to the end, you, you forget what you were, <laughs> where you were at. Well, or yeah, what happens is like, you know, you see it, there's like, say there's a, a question about a kid who's super sick being rushed into the, the doctor's office, the emergency room, whatever. And she's got this medley of clues and, you know, purple spots on, on the buttock. It's coalescing, solidifying, spreading down the legs. She's got an extreme temperature. She's losing cognitive function a ton and getting sicker or faster. And then what happens, and then you've got all these answer options, most likely diagnosis. And then you end up seeing, say, you see HSP as an option. And then due to the, over, the overload, you end up reducing all those clues to a single clue, single point of contact, we call it. And you see, you know, you, you hyperfixate on the purple spots in the butt. It feels good. You recommend it. You recognize it. You jump on HSP. You click it. You feel like you nailed it. And then, then you miss it. And you go back and you look at it. And you're like, wait, I know that a kid with HSP would not be a ton. I, I know it wouldn't spread like this. So that's a test taking myth. And it's, it's really due to that working memory collapsing on that person. And, and again, like, I don't know how you fix working memory. I don't know about it. I don't, I don't, I haven't seen anything that makes me believe that. So what we want to do is limit the, that limit that grind, limit that burden through process, through meticulous step-by-step -step processes when reading questions to limit cognitive burden so that you can hold on to the pieces of information better. And I, and I do think that that's a, that's a pretty pervasive pattern. Again, it's not going to be 100 students at a given med school, but you will see 5, 10 students in a class across med, most med schools that are behaving like that, experiencing that. So we have to come in and that's where we, you know, install methodology to offset that stuff. But I do think it starts with the way that these, these questions have evolved and the sort of unspoken blind belief that people can hold on to all this information when, when in fact, it's not, you know, across the board like that. Yeah, I, 
feel like it should be a higher number, but everyone goes through an it exam. Might, well, very well, might be. I'm sure, <laughs> I, I, who knows how many it is, right? We yeah. don't know. We don't know. We don't know how many people are making test taking or we don't know what percentage of people are making a significant number of test taking misses as opposed to knowledge misses. Because that's one of the things we're teaching people in the class and in the workshop is you do your set of questions, however many you do. And then you're analyzing the math effect and putting them into those two categories. A knowledge miss is a knowledge miss. That's getting into, into knowledge consolidation, access, retrieval, application. That gets into the stat med class stuff, of which we can talk about memory, memory palaces and whatnot. That, that's a knowledge miss. That, that's all pre-test stuff. What we don't know is how many people are making these unforced errors, these test-taking mistakes, at what rate, and how prevalent they are across the, across the table. And, and then how we can then, it's, then what, what we can do to fix it. So what well, all we do is when people come to us, I, I'll, I'll interview them and figure out which platform it either helps them and then funnel them into that, that the, the appropriate platform. And then they, they go from there. I feel like everyone has reached the point at the end of an exam and they go over the answer choice and like, wait a minute, I knew that. I misread that. I twisted that in my head. I know I've had a problem with that since probably elementary school. I used to be yelled at by teachers. You know this. Why are you getting it wrong? You're going too fast. But no one during that point in time, all the way through graduate school, focused on the test taking skills, on a process to really focus this material down to the important parts and an order of which to answer them. No, absolutely. That and that's why Statman is here. That's what we do. It's like I was whenever you realize, wait, nobody is teaching smart, motivated adults. Now this could trickle all the way down. I mean, maybe in my grandest division. I would like to change the way that education is set up across the, across the table, starting at a younger level, intervening with your highly intelligent kids, or even in the middle, and teaching methodology so that we can be consistent. I mean, this, this applies to study methodologies as well, but the idea of giving framework to, again, how do I approach a dense PowerPoint deck on the one side from study? That's a macrocosm of how do I approach a given question with consistent structure. No, and I think that means you have to know what kind of mistakes to expect. Because we can't just say, I made a silly mistake. I, I just rushed. I was impulsive. We, and as, you know, we, the, the, we need to dig deeper and we need to categorize those mistakes. We need to turn that into data that we can then use as a feedback loop to change those behaviors. But yeah, I mean, I, I think these things are pervasive throughout the culture. I think that we are not intervening. I'm, my daughter was in like the Talented and Gifted program here in West Virginia when she was in fourth grade or something, I sat down with her and she's got a little impulsivity. It probably comes from me. And I was watching the kind of mistakes she was making on this silly little reading test about like polar bears. And it was, it was shocking. Cause I, I, I always said like, Oh, I can't intervene at a younger level, but the things she was doing are just like you're talking about just, you know, really like, you know, ruling options in instead of ruling options out, grabbing onto a partial true instead of eliminating based on partial false. And then twisting to make the, 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 the thing she chose make sense, making that square peg fit in a round hole. Because if you're strong enough, you can make the square peg fit in a round hole. But if you're smart enough, you can intellectually mis manipulate an option and make it fit as well. And again, yeah, we're not teaching this stuff. We're, and I'm all about teaching people so that they can be autonomous for the rest of their careers. Like I want people to come in, you give them the skills in the class for study, or you give them the skills for the test taking, and then they're off with it. But it is frustrating to see that. Definitely. I remember in med school, I watched tons of videos, just Google search or YouTube search, you know, test taking skills, USMLE, and watched all the videos up there. And they all basically said the same basic stuff. Just read through the question or start with the interrogative, the question at the end, and then read through the question. And it was all the same, very, very basic, but not, uh, not the depth of pattern recognition that is really needed for some of these questions, I feel anyway. Oh, for sure. Well, or, or you parse, again, you parse the population. Maybe that is good enough for a third of the med school population. I don't know. I don't, I don't meet those people, you know, or half of the med school population. I don't know what the number is, right? I don't meet those people. I have friends who are physicians, and I've talked to them about what I do because they're, they're baffled by how I help med students, and I'm not a doctor, right? And I'll talk to them about test taking, and they, they're just a closed system. They say, well, I read it, and I pick the right answer. Like, <laughs> it's like that's not helpful, but that's the kind of advice we often are, are, are saddled with. Or like you said, like the, you read the interrogative first. Well, I see so many people read it first, and then it's in one ear and out the other. And 25 seconds later, they are not answering the question that was that, that's being asked. 
Yeah. Um, and they're like, well, I don't get it. I read it first. But it's like, yeah, but you're not, you're not weaving it together. And again, I, I'll talk in generalities here, but in the workshop, as you know, I mean, it's super meticulous. It's super accountable. I mean, you guys will work a question, you'll select an answer and then find out it's wrong. But we don't know where where things went off the rails. So now, Chase, I, 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 the newest iteration of the board's workshop, we've added a blueprint to it. So there's a first phase, second phase, and third phase to every question. The first phase is everything that happens up in the top, up in the passage, the vignette, the interrogative, the graphic, the labs. So that's your first phase. Second phase is how you weigh and consider each answer option, where we have you guys code these each answer option, you know, meticulously with the five, meticulously with the five code system. If choosing A is your decision, I'm interested more in the micro decisions you made leading up to choosing A. And so we're helping you guys create data on that to link back to it. And then the third phase is if, if it was a tie. So many people say, well, I always narrow down to two and I always pick the wrong one. How successful is that tie break process? And in what ways could you have been better with it? So we now have this overlay, first phase, second phase, third phase. And one of the initial things we're doing in the, the fourth piece, the analysis phase, is helping students I'd learn to identify where things are going off the rails. One student might always be messing up in the first phase. So that they're always coming, it doesn't matter how good their coding is and how well they're, they're they are weighing and, and managing working memory on, on each option because they have the wrong coordinates. I've said this elsewhere and I'll say it again, like it's like Raiders of the Lost Ark. It's like where like Indiana Jones has to go get this headpiece to the staff of Ra. And he goes to get married, and, and like she has this medallion. It, it, it has the coordinates for the, the Lost Ark of Covenant. And then the Nazis show up because that's what happens in Indiana Jones. And uh, the bad guy grabs the, the headpiece, right? And he burns, he burns like the coordinates of, on, on the headpiece in, into his hand. So the, the Nazis take it into Egypt and they're digging. But what they don't realize is there's two sides. They only have one side. And they don't have the back piece with the, uh, the extra coordinates, right? And therefore, the, the, they're digging in the wrong place, as Indiana Jones and Solid say. So that's what I, I always think of Indiana Jones, because, you know, why not? But when I'm, when I'm working with clients and I, and I see that first phase mess up, they're, they, I mean, they're working their way down to an answer. They're digging. If they messed up in the first phase, they're digging in the wrong place. This gives me an excuse, right, to think about uh, writers of lost art. But that's that's how it is for so many people in that first phase. Now, somebody else might do properly properly read the first phase, and they get down into, into the second phase, the weighing and the consideration for each answer option. Now, again, watching these videos, a lot of them are death match, like A versus B, or which one wins, or let me let me let me sift through all of them and see which like let me know where I am. You know, I don't like that because. That, that act by itself was working memory. If we are going with the idea that my big pool, my clients have working memory issues, I don't want to do that. Now, if their best friend scores really well on their NVMEs or USMLEs or whatever, and, and that's their modality, they're like, no, no, you need to skim over the answer option. We can't listen to that person. That person probably has a robust working memory. You, know, you might be smarter than that person, whatever smart means in quotes. But it's not, it's, not, it's, not, it's, not, it's not fair to say everybody should do the same thing. And that's what, what I think has got to be so frustrating for, for people in, in, in their shoes, right? Because that's, that, that's certainly one of the things you watch videos, and, and I, I presume you ask your peers, right, mm -hmm. uh, for help. And, and that's just not always the best way to go. Or we're asking the best test taker, hey, I like the scores you get. What are you doing? but they don't necessarily understand the methodology underneath what they're doing. They're, just doing, they're often doing it very organically, or they are relying on these, these robust subsets of their cognition, working memory, executive functioning, these in-depth reading skills. That is the third piece. Um, if you don't have that, it really does expose you. And that's where we want to come in. And again, I, I really think we want to limit the burden on that. So just going back to the, the memory piece, right? But our, our memory is such a big, broad concept, right? But, this is like the cognitive constitution piece of that working memory. When that working memory is overloaded, it's going to make wrong answers appear to be right because wrong answers are designed to be partially true. And so anyway, so that's sort of how we, how I think about it in part is we want to really limit burden on that working memory, but it's got to be super rigid and it's got to be robust. I'm not a tips guy. A lot of people will call me or email me and say, Hey, can you send me a few tips? I'm not being stingy about tips. I'm just not a tips guy. I mean, listen to me talking already. I mean, it's a lot, but it's a very narrow trench 
but it's very deep. And that's sort of how we operate. Because I, I think there needs to be a whole system. If you don't put a whole system in place, and we're talking about test taking, but you'll see how this relates to memory palaces as well. If you don't have an end-to-end, -end, meticulously delineated process in place, there's no way that David or I can then fix, troubleshoot, help you see what you're doing right and wrong. And I think that that's where, where, where I think everything comes from. And, this, and that, that does go back to my roots as a teacher, as an educator, as someone who, I don't like reinventing the wheel every time when I work with somebody. I want to come in, I want to have this overlay already built, this very elaborate scope and sequence process that we then plug in and we you know, help students bring on board and then we're troubleshooting from there. I think, I think having, that that's yeah, I think having that procedure, that flow is really important. And a lot of medical students like that. Unfortunately, during our studies, at least from my experience, it wasn't introduced much for step one material, but for step two material, it's everything. It's the order of operations of what's the next treatment, what's the next procedure you're going to do. And having that for your test taking as well, here's the step I'm at, here's the next step, is yeah. going to be very useful for keeping track of where you're making the mistake. Because otherwise, like you said, you can ask the top test taker in your class what material they think is most important, but you can't ask them how they study because that's going to be different than you or how they take the test. That's going to be different than you. Oh, absolutely. For sure. For sure. And then, and again, it, or then the, the, the conversation devolves into what's the best question bank? What's the best resource? Which is, those are all valid things. But those, if there's a spectrum, a continuum, that's all, all this stuff is on, that's all on the what side, the content, the package of the content, the quality of the content. That's on one side. Where, where I'm coming from is on the other side of the spectrum, the how, you know, and I think that's what this podcast seems to be about and what your passion is, is the how. How do I encode this information? So how do I receive and stream it, encode it, retrieve, apply it? Uh, and, then, and then the test taking is also a piece of this, getting into uh, what is my protocol? How do I approach these questions? And again, I, I think this analysis phase is super important where it's not just, oh, I missed that. I need to remember that. Oh, that was a silly mistake. I, I, I need to stop doing that. This spring, we're partnering with Common Bond, a company founded by graduate students to make student loans simpler and more affordable. They just launched a new loan for medical students at commonbond.co, and you're one of the first to hear about it. This loan was designed to save medical students thousands of dollars versus the federal Grad Plus loan. But it's not just about the savings. Common Bond knows med students have unique needs, so they offer flexible repayments to help you focus on your residency program. And with protections like forbearance, which lets you press pause on your student loans for up to 12 months, Common Bond has your back. All that, and you aren't even required to have a cosigner. Common Bond is also committed to impacting social good. Every time they fund a loan, they also fund the education of a child in a developing world through their social promise. A student that takes a 10-year fully deferred loan with Common Bond could save thousands of dollars over the life of that loan. And now, back to the show. Those feedbacks, those types of feedback are just frustrating and even demoralizing. Whereas if we can make it more specific and we can see the pattern see the matrix, you know, then all of a sudden you can see the glitches in the code and that's how you start to change it. We, we focus on the self-reflection. So you continue to elaborately, in detail, deliberately self-reflect, just like you're deliberate, deliberately practicing. And then that grows self-monitoring that you're then allowed, able to then run, run freely, you know, but it does, it takes time. It's behavior modification. Yeah, um, definitely. And, is. <laughs> and behavior modification is brutal. Uh, because we're humans, but that's, that's gotta be the game. That's gotta be the game. If you are not doing what you want to do from a test taking perspective, right? Yeah. So Good. I definitely want to uh, come back to the memory palace aspect. Cause that's just a, a really popular topic for this show and a really intriguing concept, I think for most medical students, but just really briefly, so I don't waste too much of your time on this. I, I did want to ask about the two things that you've brought up as far as the stat med program, the study methodology, and the, I'm forgetting the other. The test taking? Yes. Well, uh, so we have, like, we have two platforms. Is that what we're, what we're asking about? I guess so, yeah. I just kind of wanted to briefly give the audience an idea of what this process might entail. The study process or just working with the two platforms? 
Your choice. Dealer's choice. <laughs> well, all right. Well, you know, so, I mean, stat med learning is sort of the umbrella term. But what we really do is we do, we do two things. We do the stat med boards workshop. And that is for the test taking. That's for somebody who comes in. And that's really for, you really can't do this until you're at a step one, level one level. First year, second years, they just don't have the knowledge. They don't have the, the, the width, depth, breadth. All we end up seeing there is I don't know enough. So it's once you get to a step one level and beyond, then it's all good. All the way through, you know, the emergency medicine doctor who can't pass their, their, their concert. You know, it's all the same stuff at that point. But that's the, that, that's the, the board's workshop, that is like, I'm a bad test taker. I don't have a system. I'm inconsistent. I'm, I'm, I'm making too many of these unforced errors. And that's what the board's workshop does. It's one-on-one. It's online. There's some, some, some video modules, some one-on-one stuff. It's very, everything's scoped and sequenced. But to me, test taking, this is a memory thing that you might find interesting. I think, so I was listening to a Malcolm Gladwell podcast, and he was talking about basketball and soccer and saying that basketball is a, strong link system because the team with the best player is going to win the most game. And whereas soccer is a weak link system, like the team with the weakest player on the field is probably going to lose. So that's why your, your Lionel Messi, your Cristiano Ronaldo's, they haven't won a world cup. Cause it's not about it. They have maybe one of the best players of all time on their team, but it's about the weakest link in the system. So the question, so to flip this around, what is test taking? Board, and when I say test taking, I'm only talking about boards. I don't care about anything else. Board shelves and services. What is test taking? Is test taking a strong link system or is it a weak link system? So, Chase, in your experience, what would you say? So, test taking would be a weak link system. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Because people talk, I, I think we get validation when we behave erratically or inconsistently because, hey, I nailed that question. Hey, I nailed this question. But your score is not dictated by that. The score is like, it's not about how good you are, like we you know your best behavior, executing, nailing questions here and there. That's not what determines success on boards. It's how bad you are. Like, it's not where the ceiling is, how, how deep is the basement. How bad you are, how often you are bad, making these sort of unforced errors, these bad behaviors that are hurting you, you know? And so, yeah, test taking is a weak link system. So that's where, that's what the board's workshop addresses. And only that, you know, we're not getting into the study methodology. And then... And those, we run those around the clock. People can, you know, sign up and, and you run with it. The, the other thing we offer is the stat med class. And so stat, the idea behind stat was study time and testing. That's sort of the genesis behind that name. Hey, it's urgent. We're going to help you. But, you know, and those are the three pillars. We're teaching study methodology, time management, time maximization, and, and the test taking for like more like classroom and just some of the broad principles without all the practice and feedback. But that's where, and those are, they, they take about 10 days. They are scheduled. There's limited seats. We do them live in person and live online. We're getting ready to, you know, we, we have our, our summer classes posted. They're filling up now. And that's for anybody who's like an entering med student, rising for a second year, repeating for a second year, certainly. And for some boards people, some board students will do it. You know, if they, if they feel like the issue is, I made it through the first two years, but man, I... What am I going to do with all this information? How am I going to get it in? How am I going to get bang for my buck when I sit down to study and all that stuff? And that's where all the study methodology comes in. We have our core methods where you extract framework, you read dynamically in a way, and mark the text is going to facilitate retrieval practice, and you get into retrieval practice. That, that you should be read it once, mark it in a way that makes it easier to come back and self-test or do retrieval practice on, and, and emphasize organization and structure. If you don't need the organization and structure, that's where the Anki decks come in for people. But there is a percentage of students, just like with the working memory thing. So, so this, the, my take on, on the struggling classroom learner is often what they say is there's, it's not that any given topic is so hard. It's that there's so much, so fast, and I'm accountable for all of it, the speed, volume, density equation. I think those people, I think there are two, two types of minds. So this gets into the memory, mental constitution type stuff. I think you have your, your dual trackers, your two trackers. A two tracker can sit there and sit in lecture, and they can receive the information. On track one, they can build the structure. They can put like the closet. They can build the shelves. They can put the labels on the shelves, the boxes on the labels on the shelves. And on the second track, they can start putting the items on the shelves where they belong. So they're building structure and starting to house details. And I think that translates even to the way they, they read. If you're di- they're diving into a textbook, a review book, on one track, they're building structure. On another track, they're starting doing code details. I think a lot of stat med learners are single trackers. They have one track. 
They can either build structure or start throwing details in the closet and sort it out later. And after the first test, when they get shellacked on details, they are going to make a decision, conscious or unconscious, and be like, I need details. So now this closet looks like they're scribbling, metaphorically scribbling details on, on post-it notes and haphazardly slapping them all over the closet. The closet has a flickering light. There's like a leak over here in the corner, stuff's falling down. The stuff might be in the closet, but they don't know where it is. I think learning has to start from a study perspective. If it's not happening subconsciously, automatically, we have to consciously find, extract, and build superstructure first. We call that frameworking. This is a strategy that's taught in the class. We also teach, and then so on the front end, for anybody in the, at that learning phase, and I think this, this goes all the way through specialty boards, but starting at that consolidation phase, you have to start with finding structure first. You can't take too long there. It's got to be external and explicit, not internal and implicit. And then all roads must lead to retrieval practice. You've got to get to the point where you are engaging in retrieval practice sooner, than, sooner as opposed to later, not waiting, not passively reviewing, and all that stuff. Those, those are the core methods. And that's a very um, common mistake I know I made all the time was passive reviewing. Even though I told myself I wasn't at the time, I felt like I was doing some sort of space retrieval, but was doing it completely it wrong. Makes, we, well, we are wrong as humans when it comes to assessing what's working and what's not. It makes more sense to let, like, let me review. So, so I, I, I look at retrieval practice and review the dichotomy. I look at them as like opposite sides of the same coin. Review is bad. Now, some people say, oh, well, it's not bad. I mean, if you really review, mean looking, like once you've read it once and you are looking over, you are skimming, you are scanning, it, it creates that illusion of productivity, illusion of mastery. It's a trap where you are basically taking something that's supposed to be nuanced and craggy and making it nice and round and smooth. And therefore, that's just going to, and, and, and what that is, is, is it's working towards familiarity. And once you get to, I mean, and look, in undergrad familiarity, you might have killed it, right? You might have crushed it with familiarity. At a med school level and at a board's level, familiarity is just enough to help you narrow it down to two or three and then not know which one it is. And a lot of study lends itself to that. And so a lot of this is about killing mis killing misperceptions, but then replacing it with a detailed, nuanced, step-by-step -step process that helps them actualize. Now, teaching them a rigid process to plug into to, into, to learning in the classroom, learning for boards, is not as much of a direct link for, as it is for like test taking for boards. There's more of a gap. So there has to be a little more fluidity and flexibility there. And that's why in the class we teach our core methods, which is still allows for flexibility. And then we teach our augmented methods, which are like visual-based mapping, you know, there's like Pygmonic and Sketchy and all that stuff. That's great. If that works for you, awesome. But there is a value, I think, in being able to make some of your own stuff. It doesn't have to be, you don't have to be creative. You don't have to be artistic. And then you can flip that into memory palaces. So memory palaces, to me, are not a core method. These are a, they're a luxury skill for some people. Well, that's about all we have time for for this part one section. I just wanted to give you a little teaser of the material to come with memory palaces and other mnemonic devices. Please do stay tuned for the next episode where we will take a deep dive into memory palaces, mind maps, and a bunch of other cool, interesting visual markers and visual mnemonics. See you then.